Hello, Philip. Thank you very much. I'm, hopefully you can hear me when I'm saying those words. I can, yes. Get in. So thank you for getting me in. Um, thank you for inviting me along. And I'm going to tell you what I've been doing. Um, I very much enjoyed what um, Philip just said in his talk. He pretty much nailed very many of the conclusions that I'm going to see. So hopefully now you're seeing my my opening slide. You are lovely, doubly. All right. So I've had a um, I've had an interest over the last couple of years through lockdown and now about online assessment and the use of um, online exams. I am no great fan of the exam format, but it is one of the tools that is used. And if we were going to use that tool, I wanted that tool to be used as effectively as it possibly could be. So what I've been doing over the last couple of years is looking at ungoogleable questions. They're the sort of questions that would show up in an online examination or might well show up within a written assessment. And what I mean by ungoogleable is a, is a question that cannot easily be answered through a single click of a search engine, something you can't just put into Google or, or whatever and have spit back an answer to you that you can cut and paste primarily into an exam script or into another sort of short answer or essay type question and just get away with it. So we, we developed a whole range of different ideas that worked on problem solving, drawing information from a number of different places and pulling that together to create the answers and, and the answer banks that we wanted to get. We looked at using MCQs and pulled questions and all kinds of different technologies and they worked really well. They got us through the last couple of years pretty much unscathed. Our assessments from mine and other institutes were mirroring the same sort of scores that we used to get in the past and they were the quality of the answers especially with the problem solving questions was really good and um, we got good discrimination of our students. So that was brilliant. Um, then, as we all know, in November, we came across a little tool that can start to mine and pull together answers to prompts and they can generate those prompts and work them through. So I wanted to ask the question, what? How good? is are these technologies at answering what we considered to be in the past ungoogleable questions one way you, a student would have to have drawn together bits of information and come up with um with answers so i ran through mine and others exam scripts and essay questions and i generated the sort of answers that if i was going to be using this technology as a student this is what i would do so i put in the prompts see what it came up with do a little bit of editing and put it back up in most cases no editing at all so we did that and i thought it would be fun to treat chat gtp uh, gpt gtp is a, a nucleotide as if it was a student and give it some feedback and by giving it that feedback we so we start to uncover the areas to where we can address our questions in the ways we can take our assessments many of which philip just covered and mentioned in his talk so our traditional exam style question, we've all at some point been faced with this type of question. It would be discuss your favourite topic around this area. So I we had a one that was discuss the role of metals in neurodegeneration. Uh, it's a standard question we ask in our neurobiology exam and have done for quite some time because it gets them to bring lots of information from lots of different places. And we have things like I'm a mass spectrometrist by trade. I'm a bioanalytical scientist. I do a lot of proteomics. And so I have a question along the lines of compare and contrast data dependent and data independent acquisition. And they sound like nice exam questions. Um, the student has to bring together little bits of information. So I fed those into ChatGTP and then mark the answers. I also got my colleagues to blind mark the answers. I was a little bit sneaky in places and I slipped them into piles of exam scripts so they didn't know that they were marking machine generated answers. And by and large, what we discovered was the um, the level of specific knowledge, basically scientific knowledge in this case, was quite good actually. The information was correct. Multiple points were often brought together, but by and large, the text was vague. It was like, having a conversation with somebody that sort of knew what you were talking about, but really didn't fully get it. So there was a lack of depth in understanding. And it had they been online exam questions, 
I probably would have been quite impressed because they are time limited. They only have three hours to do this along with a load of other stuff. I was marking these at um, low two ones to high two twos um, was where they were popping out. If it was a, an essay based where they've had a whole couple of weeks to build it, they would probably be um, about a two two level. So it's, it's performing quite well in its ability to answer that traditional sort of discuss a topic type question, but it does it vaguely and it does it without any real understanding. So we're getting vague answers back from all of this. Um, those short answer questions that you have in an exam that are very much that tell me about something, tell me how to do a particular fact or a particular task or work with a piece of information, it was doing exceptionally well. So factual recall was impressive. I have a question that I thought was particularly good, which I, I used to probe my students, which was how do you fluorescently label a protein and image it within a cell? Outline the procedure you would do. And that gets the students, to, they have to think what they're doing. They have to draw in information from multiple lectures. Um, but ChatGTP absolutely nailed that style of question. It, um, the answers were, it was, it was as good as my model answers in some cases. So for that really short, the sort of answers you would get where you're expecting five to six lines worth of text, it was good. My feedback then, if it was a student and they were giving this was, well, actually, what you want to be doing now is fact checking this response, because some of these, I don't know where this information's come from and I don't know how you're working with it. I would like it to provide me with the citations that it's got. And I don't know if it's been mentioned earlier in the webinar, I'm, I'm looking at the the chat there, but um, the citations are getting either either made up or incorrect and they don't lead back to any realistic source. Something I believe which uh, will be solved fairly quickly, to be honest, but I would like it to be fact checked if that's what the question was. Um, we thought about doing some problem solving questions. These are ones that I really like. Um, they're Typically, I do set things like the scenarios you would have at the end of a research paper where somebody says, in the future, we are going to do this. And so I'd pull that text out of the paper, present it to the students and say, design me a set of experiments. And ChatGP would design me a set of experiments. The, the, what it would bring back would have been informative. It would have worked. But often the methods and the ideas it was pulling from were inappropriate. It hadn't critiqued what it was doing. It, as, as it was been saying earlier, it just parroted back stuff that seemed generally correct. So the method would work, but nobody in their right mind would actually go and do it that way because it would take them years. Or it's, um, I use a phrase with my students, it's like using a sledgehammer to crack a walnut. It was over the top and it was over elaborate. So my feedback in these sort of cases would go back and critique the methodology that you're doing is it appropriate for the situation that you actually have? And that's where the input would actually start to come in. So but again, in an exam situation, I would have I would have passed it. It would have been quite happily in the in the two two areas. Uh, my feedback would be the methods you've picked aren't the standard methods. This isn't what we would normally do. Go back and critique your idea, see whether it's not it is appropriate. The other thing we decided to have a look at um, is portfolios. Now portfolios we use throughout our discipline um, to evidence skill acquisition. We get students to reflect on things like the laboratory skills they've got, the mathematical skills that they've picked up, the writing skills that they've picked up, and then the next steps that you would want them to achieve. In this sort of assessment, the the, the AI, I used a couple of different ones, not just chat um, GPT, they would give you the sort of things you'd want to hear. So they'd pull on and say, oh, working in a lab gives you teamwork experience and it gives you practical experience. So it told you all that past thing that would have been occurring, but it didn't have anything in the ways of, well, what is the individual actually going to do next? What, what are you going to do that is meaningful for you? So how would you develop your own mathematics? Would you go to our learning centre and go and talk to one of the tutors? Are you going to pick up this textbook and work on it? That kind of forward facing and future development and what they would do in a tangible way was completely missing from the responses. But as a parroted back 
reflection on something that would have happened, it pretty much did a, a pretty good job, but no future planning on that. We wanted to know if it was detectable. So what I did to find out if it was detectable or not was to get it to recreate with slight variations of the prompt to the same exam question. I did it about 20 times. And um, so I got a bank of 20 answers all from the same initial or a variant of the same initial prompt and ran the lot through our local plagiarism software, which is Turnitin, to find out what the text matching would be. Um, and I would say 18 of them fell below the radar that I would bother to go and have a look at. So I tend to start pulling things up and looking at them at around about 20 to 25 percent plagiarism. Lo most 18 of them below that. There's only two that flagged at 30 to 40 percent within the straight text matching. So I wouldn't have on the numbers alone, I would have missed it. However, its style of writing of these questions was really noticeable. Um, you knew it, it was like it was written by, if it was a real person, it was like it was written by the same student and shared in a WhatsApp group and it all vaguely m messed with it a little bit to put it in. Um, the, the change in voice from past assessments from an individual would be highly noticeable because it, it structures the way in its generic form, the way it puts those texts together in a way that you can pick up. But if you're marking 200 scripts, and you're marking that quickly and we have big workloads. Are you, are you really going to pick that up? I, I think it might slip under the radar quite a bit. So, you know, the tools that we have at the minute, we're going to things are going to slip ever so slightly, in my opinion. So what do we do about it? Um, what is the future for written assessments, particularly online and time limited assessments? If Chachi, if you use these kind of things, well, the answers that you pull out are vague parroting back. They lack depth, they lack understanding. But what it does know is the student has at least recognised that they've got the right information. So I would say at best, these sort of answers become past level descriptors. Um, turn it in and the other plagiarism software didn't notice it. You could look for voice changes. So if you had a history of the student working forward, you would be able to pick it up. If you're doing reflective writing practices, I think our emphasis now needs to become really on what is going to happen next. What is the forward facing part of what your reflection is about? And the reflection part itself could become a formative tool. We talk about that within tutorials and the actual assessment part of it is the bit of what are you personally going to do? And that is something that these tools don't really give you anything about. But what really it, does, it pulls out is it really does lack creativity. So really creative crescents, those that are involving any sort of moral subjective judgment. Don't. Form particularly well with it, um, and they're the sort of directions that we can go with. I would say like the last speaker just said that it's not going anywhere. They're only going to get better. Um, it's in my, it's another tool that will become part of everyday life in the same way a spell checker is part of everyday life. A calculator is. Um, my past level descriptor for use of EndNote is now you basically got a, a bibliography that works, so it's going to be a tool and we're going to have to work with it. So what we, we think we can do with it in terms of the writing, where are my thoughts going with this? Given that it generates the basic knowledge really well, the assessment style could be then one of processing. How was that tool then fact checked? How did the students go back and look to see whether the information it got was biased? Have they compared it to other sources? Have they gone and looked for reference material to back up the information that they are getting? Move the one idea would be to move away from the just the written thing as being the the output, more sort of the checking and the underscoring and the thinking about it as being something. And how to go about using them? It generates structures and plans brilliantly, really quickly. Um, I've used it myself now for documents that I'm writing because why would you not? You've got to write a document really quickly. You put the prompts in, somebody gives you a structure, then you go and put your personal spin, your personal perspectives, your judgment on the top of that and the whole writing process increased. So as a tool, 
for generating structures, I would be working with my students to go, this is what it's going to be with, but please be aware of what you're doing. Document how you have altered what you're thinking about. Document how you have made sure what you're talking about isn't biased. Tell me where the primary references have come from. Show me how you're operating and using the knowledge this thing is giving you. And with that, I'm bang on time. I'll give you a little thank you and a smiley face. Thank you so much, David. And I think your last point there was absolutely spot on. Um, and yeah, from the reactions again that we're seeing from everyone, I, I, th I think they would agree.